Welcome into the Future Sox Roundup. I am Elijah Evans, and I am joined, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Jeff Cohen. Uh, we are here today with a little bit of a, a fun episode. We're going to start off the top by talking a few things about spring training, uh, just going over a few things that I've noticed in the last week, and then we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to look back at the past decade of draft classes and top five prospects within the White Sox system. So as we kind of look forward and we're always talking about the current prospects, it's it's worth noting some of the things that we've seen previously. So we're going to look uh, and dive deep into kind of some of the key draft picks and then the top prospects by year, starting in 2014, all the way up till last season, just as a fun way to kind of uh, recognize the system over the years, how it's changed, how it's adjusted. And then on top of that, you know, where we are today, right? Like the farm system, as we've talked about, is in a very different place than it's been um, at many different points over the past decade. So kind of reflecting upon the past is going to give us even more context for the future. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we dive into everything we have today is I am going to be out in Arizona doing some spring training stuff this coming week. So you want to make sure to, to follow me at Elijah EV8 and then follow Future Socks at Future Socks. Um, I, we're going to be getting a lot of good content out there. I'm hoping to talk to some players, get some videos on the backfields um, and all different types of stuff uh, that you're not going to want to miss because, you know, with a lot of these games not being televised and then some of them not even being on radio, uh, I'm hoping to provide a little bit more of a, a lens into spring training for many of our fans and followers. So definitely follow along. It's going to be fun. I'll be out there all week. And then next week on the Future Sox Roundup, uh, I will be talking all about everything I saw in Arizona. So that was a lot of me talking. Uh, Jeff, how you doing? How you feeling? I'm doing good, Elijah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm jealous that I'm not going out to Arizona with you, but I can't wait to next week because I'm going to have a thousand questions about different guys that you're going to get a close look at this week. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun next week. Uh, definitely an episode you're going to want to check into because Jeff's going to fire questions at me and I'm going to tell you every single thing that I noticed um, when I was out in Arizona. Also, make sure you're following Jeff at Triple A Jeff. He is going to have tons of content from White Sox prospects throughout the season. We're only a month away from the minor league season kicking off. Um, and before you know it, Jeff's going to be talking to guys in Charlotte and Winston and Kannapolis, and it's going to be a lot of content you're not going to want to miss. Um, so let's start with this uh, spring training notes. Um, I don't have a ton. You know, the White Sox have have played a variety of the regular players. There's been some good performances, some poor performances. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this. I saw you you tweeted something very funny, quoting my tweet the other day. Uh, but you know, <laughs> off the top, I, I want to talk Nick Nestrini. This is a uh, this two games now for Nestrini. He's thrown two innings in each game. He's allowed one hit total uh, in four innings pitched in spring training. Uh, there's not a lot of run, a .25 whip. Um, he just, he looks good. He looks consistent. He looks solid. I didn't get to see any video from his last start, which was unfortunate, but from what I was seeing from the pitch tracker and just from the, you know, getting out, it looks like he's committing the zone. It looks like he's attacking the zone better than, you know, he did at times last year. Um, and right now there, there's a lot of competition in terms of the White Sox rotation. Another guy that's worth mentioning, it, it's hard to imagine him being in the rotation immediately, but Garrett Crochet has been phenomenal. Uh, he struck out Shohei Otani. He struck out Mike Trout. Those are two of the best players in baseball. They in the game against the Dodgers, the game against the Angels. He he struck out both of them um, and has generally just looked really really good. His fastball's up to where it used to be a few years ago at 99, 100 miles an hour. He looks more consistent. He's pounding the zone a little bit more. Um, that's someone who you know the Sox have talked about making him a starter. I don't know when that happened, uh, but seeing Crochet look good is excellent. Michael Kopech, another guy who his first game uh, of the spring looked really solid. His command was a lot better. I, I watched every single pitch of his of his game he threw. The, the four seam, he was really spotting it better. The velo was up a tiny bit. Uh, the slider was just a lot less flat than I think it was at times last year. It had a little bit more depth to it. Um, and, you know, he was working that cutter a little bit as well. I, I want to see more from his changeup. Uh, but generally, those are three, you know, young – pitchers that are going to be pivotal to this team that have looked really solid so far this spring. Elijah, have you had a chance to see Eric Fetty yet? I have not seen Fetty. He threw, what was it, yesterday? Um, I believe he threw yesterday, and I don't think – I'm trying to remember if there – I don't think there was video for it, so I'm going to try and see what I right. can find on Fetty. He had a solid start. He gave up a run, but I don't think he – he had a decent game, um, so I'm curious to see that. And then again today, Mike Soroka pitched today for the first time uh, with the organization and another game without video. So unfortunately, didn't get to see either of those so far. But again, next week, hoping to see those guys pitch in person, which is going to be great. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, it's, there's a lot of competition. It's, it's good competition. I think, obviously, Dylan Cease, as, as Pedro Grafal said this today in an interview, Dylan Cease is the ace. He's going to start opening day unless he's traded somehow. But that's the one, like, 100% thing. I think he didn't say this directly, but Fetty has a spot considering the contract he was just signed to. Right. Beyond that, 
we don't really know. So it's fun to see these guys look good in spring training. Um, and I think Nestrini is the one X factor of a guy who I think could really just force the hand to the White Sox. If he has another two, three starts in spring training where he looks just as good as he has so far, I don't see how you can leave him off the roster as a 24-year-old who's already reached AAA and who has the upside of, of a really solid starter. Yep, yep. Got to agree. Those are some of my notes. Nothing crazy. Um, again, we will have way more spring training content once I'm out there this week. Uh, make sure you're following along. I'm going to be pumping out videos and, and just my opinions and everything else I'm seeing um, in Arizona. So let's dive into this, this kind of looking back at the White Sox history. Um, we'll start with 2014. So this is 10 years ago. We're going all the way a decade back. Um, Jeff, I'm going to let you kind of guide us here in this draft class talk. 2014, who were some of the notable draft picks and where, what does that look like today uh, when we look back at the White Sox? All right, let's take a look here. Well, 2014. I'm seeing yes, I, Rodon, I know. Oh, Rodon was the big name. Couple of relievers of note, but Rodon was the, the big one, and he was a first round draft pick. So um, that's a good sign for the White Sox. Yeah, I mean Rodon is a it's a hard one to evaluate. Um, I think because you know that's a guy who we know the talent's there. He's always the talent's been there, right? Like, that's not a doubt with Rodon. Uh, we knew that it was a frustrating start to his career. I think, you know, he had dealt with all the different injuries he dealt with. He really never got on track. We finally saw everything he was capable of in 2021, which was awesome. Um, I remember I was at his no hitter at the beginning of the season in 2021, and it was one of the best games I've ever been to personally. Um, so it's a shame that Rodon has had so many injury issues, but the guy's talent is there and you really can't blame the draft pick. You, you can't fault injury. We know that he had a first round talent and he has shown that at times with, you know, even with 2021 with the Sox, 2022 with the Giants last year was a rough one for him dealing with injuries again. With the Yankees, but a successful career when you consider everything and when you put injuries aside, it looks like a good draft pick in hindsight. Yep. Now, the, I, the question is, um, you and I have discussed this, that um, our goal today is to get a sense as to how well the White Sox have done. And we can look at it in a vacuum, but another way to do it and what I've chosen to do is just arbitrarily pick four other organizations. And then we can do a comparison. How did um, the White Sox do versus other teams? And so the four teams I selected were the Rays, Braves, Dodgers, and Astros. And I think they're all um, have a reputation as being um, fairly strong organizations um, that have had success in the draft. 100%. So looking at 2014, there's really no one of note for the Rays and the Braves. For the Dodgers, they had one starter, Alex Verdugo, and the Astros, J.D. Davis. So really, I think the White Sox ended up pretty strong there. Yeah, I mean, a Rodon there is, is definitely a, a good pick. And I think beyond, you know, the later rounds might not have been as great. But when you compare, the, the point of comparing this for everybody who's listening, right, is that these are organizations that have had continual success. Those four teams have been some of the best teams for the last decade pretty consistently and have always been teams that have not only spent money, but teams that have built through organizational development. So when you compare those teams, it's important to kind of take things with a grain of salt because, yeah, you look at the White Sox draft and it's, oh, Carlos Rodon's the only big league regular that they got out of that, sure. But it doesn't seem like there was a ton of excellent players taken in that draft by a lot of these other premier, you know, organizational teams. So that's that's that. That's good. Um, let's uh, let's get into the top prospect list because this is kind of a different angle of, you know, where things were at in 2014. The the top five prospects of the White Sox, this is a funny list. Um, <laughs> this one's one of the better ones, I think, of, of all these top fives by year. And this is all MLB pipeline rankings. Uh, the first overall prospect for the White Sox going in 2014 was Eric Johnson. Um, Eric Johnson was a, a right-handed pitcher who, you know, I, I remember when he was coming up, he definitely had a, a lot of excitement going with it around him. Um, he went to Cal. He was a big time, big time college arm. Um, you know, he was the number one prospect. He debuted in 2013 briefly, made five starts and looked pretty solid. Came up in 2014 um, and just really struggled the entire season 2014. He went back down to Charlotte. Came up in 2015, for made a few games here and there, was pretty solid all around, had a really good year in Charlotte, and it was like, oh, maybe he's bouncing back. 2016, ends up getting moved. He struggled in his few games with the Sox, goes to the Padres, made four starts for the Padres, and that was his last major league appearance. Um, he bounced around the minors for another year or two and was out of baseball by the end of 2018. 
Um, so that was, you know, first, first, first prospect on the list. And that's how it goes sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's an element of luck to these, to, especially when you draft those pitchers, right? Are they going to stay healthy? hundred percent. And then the rest of 2014, we can, we can dive into each player one by one, but the second prospect was Matt Davidson. Uh, the third was Tim Anderson. The fourth was Marcus Simeon. Uh, and then the fifth was Micah Johnson. So in that list, right, um, Tim Anderson, you know, multiple time all-star. I, I know a lot of White Sox fans have negative feelings about him since the last year or two. I am not one of those people. I will never be one of those people. I will always look back at Tim Anderson with positive feelings. Uh, the guy was just, a, he was he was amazing for multiple seasons. And he was really the heart and soul of the White Sox for, for many of the past few years. Um, and then Marcus Simeon's a guy who, you know, it's a shame, right? It's a bummer the White Sox moved him. Uh, he struggled in his rookie season in, in 20. 2014, his first mostly season, he played 64 games with the White Sox, only had a 672 OPS, uh, was moved to Oakland, had a few solid years, um, really blossomed in 2019, kind of a late bloomer, right? But he was ranked highly for a reason as a prospect. You know, he always had a really strong hit tool and he was a solid defender at both shortstop and then moved over to second where he became kind of a premium defender. Um, you know, it took him some time, but in 2019 with the A's, he broke out. Went to Toronto in 2021, was awesome. Ended up signing this massive deal with Texas. Last season was one of, you know, the better position players in Major League Baseball and especially infielders. So that's another guy where it's it's a bummer. And then you look at a Matt Davidson and a Micah Johnson um, who neither amounted to anything. Micah Johnson played right. a total of 61 games in his career, um, was out of baseball by 2018. Matt Davidson had a few moments with the White Sox. There was, there was a moment here or there. I remember a few Matt Davidson home runs where it was like, oh, this guy could do something. Uh, had a few, had a stint, brief stint in the majors again, played 13 games between Arizona and Oakland in 2022. Um, and is now, I think, out of baseball. He, he might be playing, trying to make a comeback at some point, but has not been on a roster since the end of 2022. Well, and I, I would just, excuse me, I would just point out to our uh, viewers and listeners that you did some research on the White Sox and I did research on these other organizations. We really don't know. We have an idea, but we really don't know in, until the end of the show how the White Sox really fared. Now, all these teams have had, you know, their Matt Davidson's guys that just didn't quite reach their potential and have the kind of careers we thought. But I think the question is not who didn't make it, but how many guys uh, came through and had great careers, right? And so far we've got Tim, Am Tim Anderson and Marcus Simeon and Carlos Rodon. That's a great start for two years. Yeah, but you got to factor in that Marcus Simeon wasn't with the White Sox when he did that. So that's well, an organizational drawback right. because he traded before he ever blossomed fully. So right. in reality, only two players that have actually come been successful with the White Sox at least. Okay. All right. I was just yeah, saying in terms yeah. of your ability to draft right. major league talent. For sure. A hundred percent. Going into 2015, tell us about some of the, you know, the top draft guys in 2015 and then where we're at now from there. Well, the number one pick was Carson Fulmer and uh, the team didn't have a number two or number three pick, but there were two um, late round picks of interest, uh, Sebi Zavala in the 12th round and in the 22nd round and still kicking Danny Mendick. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Tell us, 22nd. Yeah, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Those three from that draft class? Well, um, you know, when you don't have a second or third round draft pick, you're, you're really handicapped, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you, uh, you, you, can't really, you can't really expect yeah. the fourth and fifth rounders to pop. Right. And uh, Fulmer was a guy that I, I remember when we drafted him, I was like, that guy could be an ace. And I think a lot of people thought that he he had all the upside in the world. The stuff was disgusting. Um, you know, he was really advanced for his age. He dominated in college. Um, that was a guy who just I, I think most people would have said Carson Fulmer was going to be, you know, still pitching at a high level in the major leagues today, really. I know that was that was what nine years ago but i think that most people expected him to have a really long major league career and things have just not gone his way unfortunately um and he's become you know he, he's at a, i'm not sure where he is right now let me check um but he you know i think he he made three yeah there you go he made three major league appearances last season for the angels uh, i knew he had kind of kicked it a little bit but he's mostly been in the minors bouncing around a little bit um i think he Technically is with the Angels organization still right now, um, but only, you know, total of 77 career games in the major leagues with a 6-1-4 ERA is just not at all what was expected from a guy who was a first rounder. All right. Um, looking at, uh, and then Mendick and Zavala, right? Solid big right. leaguers. I mean, they've had, for late round picks, they've both been big league pieces for the White Sox for right. a handful of time. Yeah. 
uh, looking at the 2015 prospect rankings, one and two were Carlos Rodon and Tim Anderson, who we've already touched on. Um, ultimately, you know, both guys that were drafted highly and had major league careers. I don't, I don't want to hear complaints about those two. There's nothing to complain about. Number three, Frankie Montes, um, another guy like Marcus Simeon, who was drafted by the White Sox and was expected to be kind of a big deal, ended up getting traded, uh, moved to Oakland, kind of had a breakout year in 20, I want to say 2019. Yeah, he had a 263 ERA in 2019, really started to find his footing, had another really good season in 2021. Um, and then was moved to the Yankees, was with the Yankees. Now he just signed with the Reds in free agency. Um, has has had ups and downs, um, but generally speaking, another guy that the White Sox kind of gave up on too early. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And we're going to see a lot of those as we go forward, right? That's, I mean, that's, just, that, that's just baseball. I don't think that's really a criticism of the White Sox. 100%. Hundred yeah. percent. It's it's just tricky. There's guys you can evaluate and you can think you've got talent and it just doesn't work out with you and then they change the scenery and it clicks, right? That's how it goes. Um, you know, the the fourth the fourth ranked prospect in the team was Spencer Adams, um, who was drafted I want to say a few years prior to that. Uh, I think it was I think maybe it was just one year before. I think he might have been a, a twenty fourteen draft guy. Um, he was super high projection. Um, he fell back in the draft a little bit. He kind of was had a, a lot of excitement around him never made a major league appearance um you know he he bound he was in the white sox organization for a long time um had his had his spurts here and there where he looked solid 2018 was a pretty good year for him uh in charlotte in 2019 really struggled and then ended up being uh, released from the organization and has not bounced he's not i don't believe he's pitched since then with a major league uh, affiliation so another guy unfortunate right a lot of a lot of draft projection second round pick a lot of hype around him and it just sometimes just doesn't happen and then Micah Johnson was the fifth ranked prospect that year who we talked about earlier as someone who has a few a few appearances here and there but has been out of baseball since 2018 so when you look at that draft on that prospect list though three guys at the top that have all had big league careers just two mm-hmm. the last one being someone who didn't do it with the organization just like Simeon on the last list right and then just quickly to look at those other four other organizations and just see how they did just as a rough comparison. So the Rays drafted Brandon Lau and Jake Cronenworth that year. Um, the Braves um, drafted Mike Soroka and Austin Riley. The Dodgers drafted Walker Bueller and the Astros. You remember back then the Astros were awful, but they were yep. really putting a lot of emphasis on the, their ability to draft. Well, that year they drafted Alex Bregman and Kyle Tucker. So it's when you look around the league. It's a that's that's a rough one. That draft class when the White Sox came away with Carson Fulmer, who didn't pan out, in addition to two you know career backups, and then you look at those guys, um, Austin right. Riley, Card, Kyle Tucker. Those are some of the best players in, in Major League Baseball. So that's a year where you definitely can say that was that was not the best year <laughs> the draft uh, for the White Sox. Moving into to 2016, who were who were some of the picks in 2016 that you put down, Jeff? Well, we had Zach Collins at number one, Zach Birdie at number one, Alec Hansen at number two, and Alex Call at number three. Um, an, another another bust of a class, right? Yeah, you look at number five, at fifth rounder in that year actually was Jimmy Lambert, who has carved out a decent career in the bullpen mm-hmm. and is going to be in the bullpen this year probably. Um, and then you can also look at the tenth round with Zach Remillard, um, who has you know been a backup here and there the last two seasons. Twentieth uh, round, Matt Foster, who had a brief stint in the bullpen, uh, hasn't gone much where with it. But yeah, that's a rough first three rounds. I think the the Collins was you know that was in a time where. That was, he was supposed to be the post AJ Brzezinski catcher. I think a lot of people had him as the next great catcher in Chicago. The bat right. was tons of power. He was always a little bit weaker defensively, but it was like, oh, this guy's going to be like a premium offensive catcher wherever, he, or first baseman if he ends up having to move there. Either way, he was expected to, to really just hit. Um, and Alec Hansen's another guy who was really, really high projections um, for a long time, honestly. So that was that's a hard one uh, to look at. I think that draft class is. Uh, who'd you say the last two on that list were? No, Zach Birdie. Yeah, I mean, and there was a time where he looked like he was going to be a stud, and then Alex electric. Hall. Yeah, so I mean, those are kind of all guys that that didn't go much of anywhere. I think Birdie Birdie pitched this year. Actually, I remember watching him with Tampa. He he got to the major leagues this year with Tampa. He's had a pretty good minor league career. He's been really good the last two seasons in the minors. Right. Um, yeah. So maybe he's. I mean, he's still you know Birdie's still twenty eight years old. He was drafted pretty young. So that's a guy who is still around. Um, he's still kicking it. Zach Collins is, I believe, I know he was with Cleveland for a while. Um, I think he played a few games with Cleveland. 
Um, I don't think he's gotten much action, and I believe he's playing internationally now, if I'm correct. Oh, right. Wow. And then, yeah, and then Alec Hansen is, you know, he pitched, he last pitched for Birmingham in 2021 um, and has not been with an organization since then. So, unfortunate, right? Alex, uh, let's see, let's see, Alex Call. Alex Call, actually, I remember him playing this year. Yeah, Alex Call was a, that's funny. Alex Call was was a starter this season for Washington. He played 128 yeah. games this year for the Nationals. Yeah, had an, okay, had an okay year, I seem to recall. Yeah, not not great, but not bad, actually. He played yeah. last 2022, he was solid. 2023, he wasn't quite as good, but that's interesting. Another guy, that's another another player on this list who, once he left the organization, has actually carved out a career for himself. Right, right. So there you go. That's a, that was a rough one. Again, um, looking at the top prospects that season, it was a lot of the guys we've already mentioned. Carson Fulmer was the first prospect. Um, we, we talked about that. Just really unfortunate. Just never quite found his command. Tim Anderson was the second prospect. Still, he ended up debuting that season and had a great rookie year. Well, some shines, shine, so promise. Um, Spencer Adams was the three. We talked about him already. And then the four and five in 2016 were Adam Engel and Trey Michalowski. Um, Adam Engel you know, major leader. Yeah. He was a yeah. outfield type, good defense, good speed, never quite found it with the bat. Um, I think he's in AAA right now for somebody. Um, you know, he played a few games last year for the Padres, played for the Sox all the way from 2018 or 2017 all the way to 2022. So it was a regular on the major league team, never really found it with the bat, but good defense. And then Trey Mikulowski, uh last played for Charlotte in 2019 and has not been with an org since then. Um, wow. So that's that prospect list is rough. You see Tim Anderson there at number two, but there's really nobody else on that list who is is of note um, in their career. All right. And again, just looking at our other four organizations, yeah. Rays, Josh, Josh Lowe and Jake Fraley, the Braves, Ian Anderson, who was pretty, pretty impressive till he got hurt. And then the Dodgers, Gavin Lux and Will Smith, two uh, key cogs. And then the for the Astros, the poster child of uh, a pitcher who was so highly vaulted and just couldn't, you know, had couldn't overcome injuries. In fact, he's still trying. Forrest Whitley. Mm, yeah, that was yeah, the same mean, time prospect. So I mean, right? Yeah. Even the best of best teams have players that just don't work out, even if they're drafted really highly and they can be have all the talent in the world. It's just not always going to work, but. Again, that's another draft class where those are multiple big league pieces drafted by some of those teams. Meanwhile, the White Sox don't have anybody who really became a significant big league piece from that class. And you know what, Elijah, I mentioned the Dodgers, Gavin Lux and Will Smith. I didn't look at page two. In that same draft class, Dustin May and Tony Gonsolin. Wow. Yeah, that's the wow. Dodgers for you. <laughs> that, yeah. is, that is the definition of the Dodgers drafting for you. I mean, that's that's four guys who are all significant big league pieces um, yep. at times, you know, and with the White Sox class who have not had, didn't have anybody from that draft class. So, all right, what's uh, what's up next? 2017. Let's, let's hear about 2017 draft class, Jeff. Well, we've got three interesting names in the first three rounds. Jake Berger, number one, Gavin Sheets, number two, and Luis Gonzalez, number three. All right. And the jury's still out, I would say. I mean, it, it doesn't look great, but – it could, it could end up, it could end up solid. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, again, unfortunately, Jake Berger, you know, no longer with the White Sox, right? But we really saw everything he was capable of the last year and a half. And that's a guy who battled through a ton of injuries, had the double Achilles tear, um, was just, had a really hard start to his career once he was drafted by the White Sox. And and he, he, the dude can hit, man. I mean, he, I still, the defense is still shaky. He still strikes out a lot, but the dude can simply hit. Last year was a, was an amazing season for him. 28 home runs, finished the year, or 34 home runs. Pardon me. I was looking at doubles, 28 doubles, 34 home runs last year. And for Jake Berger, finished here with the Marlins, is expected to be, you know, a key cog for them. Gavin Sheets uh, is another, is a tricky one. You know, he has shown flashes um, over the past three seasons with the White Sox, but ultimately, you know, he has been forced to play right field where he is, struggles, to, generally speaking, um, has found his footing to a decent degree. And then it's the power that excites you, but it hasn't really gone anywhere. It's been 10-ish home runs a year the past three seasons. Uh, last year was definitely a rough year for him. He's kind of battling for a spot now on the roster heading into this season. So, uh, another guy that's interesting. And then Luis Gonzalez, um, a yet another player who was not, didn't get anywhere with the White Sox, really. He played in a total of, I think, 
total of nine games with the White Sox between 2020 and 2021. Went over to the Giants, um, was pretty solid for the Giants in 2023. Yeah. He, had a, he had a big league role. Um, and then last year was mostly in AAA for the Yankees, um, but as someone who's at the very least a AAA quality player at this point in his career and still around. Um, not a bad draft class. It's not great. Let me put you on the spot, Elijah. Um, even if it's with another team, what do you think the future looks like for Gavin Sheets? Is he a major league regular for somebody else? I am not sure I see it. Um, I think that his approach and his offense just has not gotten there. And because he struggles in right field, he's really best fit to play first base. And if the bat is not where it, you'd think it is be at, at first base, that bat, it, what he's done offensively just can't survive really. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I think that it, it probably is not with the White Sox. I think he could be, realistically, I think whether it's the Sox or not, a – bench left-handed power bat is probably his role in the future. Um, I don't see him being a significant starter, and I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he spent some time in AAA this year. All right. What about you? Where are you at? No, I think that's fair. Um, it's This year is going to be fascinating to see how many, if any, at-bats he gets in Chicago, right? Yeah. It is going to be interesting. It's, I mean, he's he is not he doesn't have a spot. The last two years he had a spot going into camp. This year he's fighting for his spot. He doesn't have one locked up. So right. it's going to be interesting to see if some of these non roster invites push for his spot for sure because it's not guaranteed. Um, Twenty seventeen. This is where. So you just said the draft class, which was still another kind of eh, draft class. This is where the prospect list completely takes a turn because of the Chris Sale trade, the Jose Quintana trade, and the. Oh, interesting. This is where we start to see a whole new influx of players. Uh, four of the top four players are players that weren't drafted by the team, were brought in via trades. That's Yoan Moncada, Lucas Giolito, Michael Kopech, and Reynaldo Lopez, with Carson Fulmer rounding it out at five, who I think made his debut later that season or maybe the year after. Um, so 2017 list is the top four guys are all non-drafted by the team. So we're not talking about the team draft, but we're talking about players that were acquired at the start of the rebuild um, that was supposed to, you know, bring glory back to Chicago, right? Um, so starting with Mankata, uh, this is we this is probably a topic for a whole nother podcast, to be honest, with some of these players here. Um, but Yohan Mankata, it, it's talent, talent, talent. He was the number two overall prospect in baseball that season, uh, you know, brought over from the Red Sox and, and as the headliner of the Chris Sale deal. His first, he came up with the Sox in 2017 that season. Pretty rough start, but not bad. Showed some signs. 2018, same thing, was a first season as a full-time big leaguer. Some moments, a lot of walks um, in that season where you got to see kind of his approach develop a lot. And then 2019, uh, 2019 Mankata feels like a fever dream looking back at it. Um, a 915 OPS, 25 home runs, and just truly one of the better hitters in baseball that season. Uh, that was a wall playing, you know, worth noting, gold glove defense. He moved yeah. over to third oh, yeah. base after coming up as a second baseman um, and became – an elite defender at third base. So that 2019 season was special. Um, it really was. It was It was all that he – it was the first step, at least we thought, of everything that he could be. Um, 2020, COVID, injury, I'll negate that. 2021, definitely took a step back, still a productive big leaguer. 2022, bottomed out, was one of the worst offensive players in the league. Uh, last season, a little better, had a good stretch at the end of the season, but the injuries have just continued to pile up. He's only played around 100 games the past two seasons each. So it's hard to judge with Moncada. You know, he was the top prospect in the team. He was the top prospect in baseball. Um, really one of the better prospects the White Sox have ever had. Um, but it just has not been the career that that many wanted from him. Yeah, a fascinating trade. I mean, you get you get um, Michael Kopech and the number one prospect in baseball. I mean, you you can't do better than that. It's just a question of whether these guys pan out. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was gonna, I was going to actually change the subject for just a second. I've got another question for you. So we're talking about building the White Sox through the draft, but of course there are other ways to do it. One is signing international players, and we can talk about that and what success or lack of success the White Sox have had. Another is through trades, and here was an example of some terrific trades that the White Sox made um, that year. And then if you add in the trades they made at the deadline last year, I would argue that the White Sox in the last five or six years have done really well um, uh, trading mate for uh, minor leaguers. I, I generally agree with you. I've always been a fan of, of a lot of the trades they've made. It just in the moment, the trades have looked really good. Looking back at them now, it 
you can't really see the results that have come from some of the trades. I think oh. the trade with the, the sale trade, right? These top four prospects we're discussing now, Kopech, another guy who came up, showed a ton of promise. He had to deal with a lot of arm injuries. He missed the entire 2019 season, sat out 2020, looked good in 2021, was great out of the bullpen or great, great out of the bullpen in 2021, looked solid as a starter in 22. And then last year was, was a really hard year for him. He's looking to bounce back this year, right? The other trade, the Adam Eaton trade, actually looked a lot better, in all honesty. Lucas Giolito yeah. was the best pitcher on the White Sox for multiple seasons, and, yeah. and now is, you know, he had a rough year the last year or two, um, and is now with Boston. Um, 2022 was rough for him. Last season, he was good with the White Sox, actually, before getting traded and flipped for another guy who we're going to talk about later, top prospect. Um, but, you know, that trade. And then Lopez, right, struggled at points, um, kind of became a – had to go into a more of a relief role after struggling as a starter – um, but also multiple really quality big league seasons uh, for the White yep. Sox was probably the best reliever in 2022. Um, so that trade, in hindsight, looks pretty good. And those were the second and fourth ranked prospects in the system. And then also that trade, he's not ranked as highly. He was ranked 10th in 2017. Dane Dunning, too, um, who ended up right. another guy who's carved out a really solid big league career and, and brought over Lance Lynn, who I know he was rough last year, but was really solid for the Sox in 2022. So that's, that's a that's looked really good and this is what we're talking about with the, the farm system it's not all the draft there's a lot more that goes into that um i tell me any good comparisons for the 2017 with some of those other teams all right let's take a quick look um it looks like a kind of a lean year the um the rays drafted drew rasmussen and uh taylor walls and josh fleming the braves had one draft pick of note kyle wright um, the Dodgers, after that phenomenal 20, 2016, the only draft pick of note was Connor Wong. And, um, and if the Astros, the same thing, nothing special. Corey Jolt, Jake Myers, and Chaz McCormick. Yeah, three three uh, big leaguers right now, but yeah. yeah. Um, so not a great year for the Sox, but again, that was the year where the trade capital was really solid. Um, going to 2018, let's talk some draft class, and then there's another big trade we have to talk from that year, too. Oh, man. Wow. This will be interesting. Oh, no. So 2018 is Nick Madrigal at one, Steel Walker at two, Connor Pilkington at three, and then one of those late-round guys who has popped is Davis Martin at 14. Okay. Well, I mean – Madrigal is a tricky one. Uh, I think that's a guy who you were, we were hoping was going to be, you know, the second baseman of the future. I think that was kind of always generally the the hope with him. Uh, it didn't quite happen. Um, it was, it was hard to, it's tricky. Uh, you know, he was flipped in that, that Kimbrel deal, which was, is infamous now. And he, he's carved out a role for himself with the Cubs on the, the other side of town, uh, but definitely never became that, you know, elite contact superstar that he was supposed to be. He was, he was looked at coming out of college as like the best bat to ball skills in the draft class and a guy that was just going to get on base no matter what. Um, and it, it really has not gone that way for him. Steel Walker, Connor Pimpington, nothing of note there. Davis Martin, I'm hoping to see Davis Martin uh, reach the big league team this year, to be honest. He looks healthy. He's going into camp trying to get healthy and, and make an impact this year. So that's somebody to watch, but not a lot, not a lot there in that, in that draft class as well. Um, yeah. One thought about Nick Madrigal, yeah, whether or not he would have been the answer at second base, even just being league average ever since the trade, that's that position has been a black hole with the white Sox. That's hundred percent true. Um, looking at the 2018 top prospects, Another big trade of note um, from that rebuild that kind of happened at the end of late in 2017 uh, was the Jose Quintana trade. Um, and then also an international signing who is of all these signings, players, everything is, you know, the, the, the shining star amongst everything else. Um, so the top prospect was Eloy Jimenez in 2018, who was acquired as, as the headliner of the Dylan Cease deal. I remember when he was a prospect coming up with the Cubs, there was a video of him hitting a light tower, a 500 foot home run. And it was like, this dude's nice. insane. Um, and, you know, Jimenez is similar to Moncada, right? We don't need to talk too much about it. Injuries, injuries, injuries. The bat talent is there. He has become a full-time DH, which is fine. Um, but, you know, it's it's just all about getting the guy healthy and keeping him on the field and seeing what he can do. So we'll, we'll see what happens. This is going to be kind of a make-or-break year for, for Jimenez. Kopech was number two that year. We talked about him. Number three, um, Luis Robert Jr., who I, I remember the day when he signed with the White Sox. Um, I was – I saw my phone notification and I, I looked over at my friend and I was like, this guy is going to be awesome. Um, and he was the a crazy contract that he signed to when he came over um, and is obviously the best player in the organization right now. Uh, Alec Hansen was four. We talked about that. 
didn't happen. And then number five was kind of the add on um, in the Eloy Jimenez deal, which was Dylan Cease. Yeah. So that one worked out pretty well. The 2018 prospect list, you know, Eloy and Luis and, and Cease all being on the top of that list is pretty good, all things considered. I know Alec Hansen didn't go well, but, you know, Dylan Cease being the fifth ranked prospect that year and being the ace of the team now for the last few seasons is a is a pretty good turnout from that year. Yeah. yeah, you know, we're talking about two really mediocre drafts back to back, but two years of phenomenal trades, just phenomenal. And it's and it sucks because I think you look back now and it's like, yeah, we had all those acquired players acquired and it, what is it amounted to? And nothing is the reality. A 2021 divisional championship is all that it's amounted to, which is unfortunate, but I, that doesn't mean there wasn't good things happening. And I think that's a lot of people have this skewed image of like this rebuild was a total fail and it, and it did fail that the reality is that rebuild didn't work, but there was a lot of good things that happened and a lot of players that were brought in that were the right players. And sometimes it just doesn't pan out. Well, and I'm wondering too, um, let me put you on the spot again here. So some of it with these guys not panning out, right? It's just injuries and bad luck. Um, I wonder how much, if any, was player development or lack of player development or, um, just the way they were managed. I, I think there's there's something to be considered there, I think. I don't think that's a crazy thing to consider. I think it's important to to take things with a grain of salt and understand that there is a lot that goes into players developing that's not just purely based on their talent. So I think that's a good point you make, and it's it's definitely worth you know thinking about. Um, what was that was another rough draft class for the White Sox? Twenty eighteen. Anybody of note with some of the other teams? Well, uh, for the Rays, two really uh, big pitchers, Matthew Liberatore and Shane McClanahan. Um, no one of note for the Braves, for the Dodgers, yet another um, key piece, James Altman. And uh, two important pieces for the Astros, Jeremy Pena and J.P. France. Yeah, so some, some stuff there, more than the White Sox ended away with yeah. in comparison to most of those. Again. Teams, right? Again, um, shifting to 2019, 2019, what are we, what are we looking like? I know the first one, but tell us about that class. Yeah. Uh, 2019, it was Andrew Vaughn one, and then two or three were two pitchers that I think people were really optimistic about, um, Matthew Thompson and Andrew Dahlquist and for whatever reason, you know, not every pitcher hits and they just haven't quite, um, lived up to what people thought they were going to be. Yeah, unfortunate. Um, I know Thompson was just traded last week um, to the to the Cubs. So that's a guy who had a ton of stuff. The curveball was excellent coming out of high school. The arm was live. He's still a pretty young guy. I still don't think his career is over. I think he's probably due for a bullpen change or a shift to the bullpen. Um, Dahlquist has struggled with the White Sox. And Vaughn, you know, I, I like Andrew Vaughn, but third overall pick, first baseman, uh, one of the best hitters in college in Pac-12 history. He was historically good with, with Berkeley. Um, it hasn't been as good as it should be, uh, in my opinion. And I think that this is the year where we're really hoping to see an Andrew Vaughn leap or it's going to be, you know, what does his future look like beyond this with the White Sox? Yeah. Um, shifting over to the top prospect lists, pretty much the same guys we've all talked about. Eloy slots in at one, Kopech two, Cease three, Luis Robert four, Nick Magical five. So all in all, a lot of talent, mostly traded talent and Magical slotting it as the fifth. Um, but, you know, a lot of guys that were acquired um, and continued to be solid. So how about the other the other teams in 2019? Okay, nothing of note yet for the, now recognizing that some of these guys can still pan out, like Greg Jones, the number one pick for the Rays, but no one of note yet. For the Braves, Michael Harris, uh, Shane Langoliers, which is significant because he was involved in the trade. Olsen. I guess it was either Sean Murphy or Matt Olson, one of those. I think that was the Olsen trade. And then the Dodgers, being the Dodgers, Michael Bush and Ryan Pepio, um, two more important players. And then the Astros, Hunter Brown in the fifth round. And the number one pick, interestingly, Corey Lee. Interesting. He was yeah. the White Sox, right? So yeah. not, not a crazy draft class from any of those teams, but when you look at the White Sox, right, it's Andrew Vaughn and then pretty much nothing else from that year of note. I know DJ Gladney was that year too, who's a, who's late in the draft. Uh, still a guy that I have some hope for. He's shown a lot of power at the in the minors for the White Sox, um, who's still, you know, around on and could, could make a jump this year, hopefully. Um, shifting to 2020, this was the shortened draft. So I'm sure there's a little bit of slim pickings in terms of uh, which year. This, yeah, this was the weird COVID year draft where it was only five rounds. Right. And uh, the five players that the White Sox took, number one, uh, Garrett Crochet. That looks like it could still um, pan out. Uh, as you noted, he's off to a great start this spring. Yeah. And then 
Two, three, four, five. Jared Kelly, Addison Coffee, Cade Michaels, and Bailey Horn. Yeah, that was a hard year. Uh, that's a tricky yeah. year to judge because of of COVID and everything else. But um, I think Kelly is a guy who had, was a ton of expectations. Is still younger than I think most people realize. Um, I think Kelly is. Yeah, he's moved to the bullpen in the last year or two. He looked good at times out of the bullpen last year. I think his arm is live enough where you can still see him being a decent reliever in the future. Uh, Bailey Horn was just reacquired after being traded for Ryan Tapera, um, was reacquired for Matthew Thompson, who we just mentioned the year prior. Um, so that was a weird little swap. Neither of them have really become big leaguers yet, but Horn's a guy that I think the Sox are looking at as a, as a reliever potentially in the next year or two. Um, not a bad draft class. Um, the top prospect list that year was Luis Robert at number one. Love it. Cool. Great. Um, Andrew Vaughn, who was drafted the year before at number two, Michael Kopech at three, Nick Madrigal at four, and then Jonathan Stever at five. Um, another guy who hasn't quite found it. Uh, we'll see if a fully healthy season Stever could be something this coming season. Um, I'm right. really curious to see what he can do this year, uh, but he'll probably, it'll take him some time. He made a few major league appearances with the Sox. Um, and I think it'll, he's around. I think he'll be in Charlotte this year, probably. Um, and just yeah. see what, see what's in the tank for him. Not a bad group there. Uh, Robert is obviously the star. You know, Kopech, and is, is, we'll see what happens this year with him having given up. That draft class is is another one that doesn't look great. I think I, Crochet is kind of the thing that's holding that together, right? If Crochet takes a huge step forward this year and looks healthy and like himself again, I still have a lot of hope for him. But generally speaking, another not great draft class. So let's stop for a second and look at the, those, the last three years we covered. Nick Madrigal, Andrew Vaughn, Garrett Crochet. And that's it. Those are the three guys. Yeah, in that's over, th over three years. Yeah, right. And magical not with the team. Crochet has been injured and has not shown yet what he's capable of. I still think he can. Let's be clear. Um, and Vaughn's a guy who's been a major leaguer for the last few years, but has still not been number three overall pick level. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, unlo unfortunately, as opposed to the previous two years. No, no uh, noteworthy trades to at least, you know, right. cover up your sins in the draft. Right. Yeah. So looking at that, that COVID short draft, is there anybody that super stands out from those other teams? Well, for the Braves, uh, the Braves and the Dodgers, we got some standouts for the Braves. They've got Spencer Strider, Bryce Elder and Jared Schuster, one pitcher who's made it and two others who look close. And then the Dodgers, yet again, Bobby Miller, Landon Knack, Clayton Beater, and Gavin Stone. They only had five picks that year, and four of them four <laughs> are looking really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, four legit pitching prospects there, and one who's already a key piece of their rotation now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's good. There's there's been years, and when you look at these past ten years, a lot of these years we're mentioning, the White Sox have walked away with maybe one big leaguer, and some of these other teams have walked away with multiple pieces of their core. Uh, all right, twenty. We're, we got these last few years. We're gonna we're gonna zoom through some of these because I think these are a lot of guys that we've talked about in the past, and then you get everybody who listens to us knows about most of these players. Twenty twenty one. Um, who are the the players of note in that season? Right, and and again, it's port. It's important to point out as as we go through the list, it will be obvious. But a lot of these guys are it's still early in their development, and yeah. so we really don't know. It's all speculation at this point. But Definitely. 2021 is Colson Montgomery, Wes Kath, Sean Burke, one, two, three. Others of note, Tanner McDougal, Frazier Ellard, Terrell Tatum, and Adam Hackenberg. There's some there's some guys there. That's a, I yeah. mean, obviously yeah. Colson Montgomery, the number one prospect for the White Sox, top 15 prospect in baseball, going to be the shortstop at some point this season, as we've talked about many times. Uh, but beyond that, there's there's some pieces there. I think Kath has been tough to watch so far in his career. Uh, he's struggled a lot with his approach, hasn't quite found his footing, still very young, still has upside. We're going to see what happens from him this year. Burke's a guy we just talked about recently on the podcast, um, hoping we can see a fully healthy season out of him because he showed a ton of promise the last time he was fully healthy. Um, and then some of those other guys, McDougal's a guy that is a big breakout candidate, in my opinion, for this coming season. Um, fully healthy now, his second full season back from Tommy John. Um, I expect him to really take a step forward this year. And then, you know, Terrell Tatum had a big year last year. Fraser Ellard's going to be a potential bullpen option soon. There's there's some some pieces in that draft, I would say. Yeah, and I think it's significant. I think 2021, we're going to start to see a change with the White Sox that uh, in those other years, there was – you know, there's some misses in the first couple of rounds and no depth in the system. 
Right. But I think that starting the change in 20, we'll see that it has started to change in 21 and then really take off 22, 23. Yeah. And again, yeah. it's those players are early in their career, so it's hard to gauge exactly where they'll end up because there is a handful of the guys from those previous years that might have looked good in their first year or two and then just didn't pan out long term. So our, our hindsight kind of skews that view a little bit. But generally speaking, the depth improved. Um, 2021 top five was Vaughn, Kopech, Madrigal, who we mentioned already. Uh, and then Crochet and Jared Kelly, who we've talked about as well. Uh, Crochet is, we're hoping a big year. Kelly has not quite panned out so far, but is made a shift to the bullpen and is looking to kind of make it there. Um, from that year, that, that was a pretty deep group of guys that we drafted that year, or the Sox yeah. drafted that season. Um, who were some of the other guys drafted uh, by other teams in that season that uh, maybe just a couple, not have made it so far? Just a couple of quick notes. For the Braves, A.J. smith Shaver, and for the Dodgers, good Lord. You know, the previous year, Bobby Miller, Landon Nat, Clayton Beater, and Gavin Stone. Then 2021, they had Nick Nostrini and Emmett Sheehan. So they they draft the pitchers and they develop them. Holy cow. The pitching development of the Dodgers is, is pretty spectacular. I think anybody who follows baseball closely knows that. Um, and hopefully the Sox are going to benefit from that because Nostrini is legit. Yep. So um, continuing on to, to 2022, well, we're, uh, we, I think most people know the 2022, but tell us um, some of these picks so far. All right, I'm going to run through a lot because it, uh, it at least now it appears to be a fairly deep draft. You got yeah. one, two, three: Noah Schultz, Peyton Pallett, Jonathan Cannon, um, Jordan Sprinkle at four, Tyler Schweitzer at five, Mario Camaletti eight, Michael Turner nine, Tim Elko ten, Jacob Burke eleven, Brooks Baldwin eleven, Mason Adams thirteen, Sean Murphy fourteen, Billy Seidel fifteen. All guys who look really good right now. Yeah, and I want to. I'm Tristan Stivers too at 16. I did an interview with him, uh, a guy who I think could be a really serious pen uh, bullpen arm in the future too. So, I mean, that's and then Eric Adler also another guy who could be a bullpen arm was in that draft class too. So, th it's hard to gauge right when we're looking only two years out of this as opposed to these other draft classes that we've seen what's happened over the last seven eight years plus whatever. Uh, but this draft class so far has shown a lot of promise and a lot of depth. I'm not saying that there's ten big leaguers in this draft because there's not. But there's a handful of players that are going to be legit big leaguers, and there's also a good amount of players that are going to be quality organizational guys who they might not be a big league impact player, but a lot of these players are going to reach the upper levels of the minors and at least contribute um, at that level, as opposed to some of these other drafts where half the players in the draft class haven't even made it to, to double A, right? So this is yep. a pretty deep draft all around, and, and that reflects that on the prospect list. I think the prospect lists were – they don't look great. Um, because there was there were some international signings that are different than some of those draft class signings. But 2022, uh, Colson Montgomery is the one that's that's a given. He was the top pick from the year before. Still the top. He's been the top prospect for the last three years now. Uh, Oscar Colhas at number two. Jose Rodriguez at number three. Yoelki Cespedes at number four. Wow. And Norge, and Norge Vera at number five. So that was a heavy international list. Wow. Um, so all four of those guys beyond uh, beyond Montgomery were, were international guys. So interesting to look at, um, you know, only two years ago, but unfortunately uh, doesn't look great for, for the rest of that list beyond Montgomery. I think at Colos, this is going to be, we'll see what happens this year. He's probably going to start in AAA. We'll get another shot at the big leagues, I'm sure, at some point. Um, last year was rough, but I'm not counting him out yet. Jose Rodriguez, a guy that should not get some time in the majors this year, hopefully, um, has looked good. I, I the outlook on him and the profile is a little bit iffy um, in some ways, in my opinion, but somebody that should be a major league option this year. Cespedes has struggled a lot. Um, really, he got up to Charlotte at the end of the year last year, but has just not looked like a big league hitter for the most part in the last year or two. And then Norge Vera dealt with some injuries, um, going to be getting some innings under his belt this year, and we're going to see where he goes from there. Elijah, quick question again. Um, the only other international guy we've talked about going back to 2012 is Luis Robert. I'm curious – and so that doesn't really speak well at all for um, the, what the White Sox have done on the uh, internationally. Can you think of some other notable draft picks? Uh, I mean, I know we've got a couple recently, uh, Mongolan, but um, can you think of some guys uh, that were notable at the time? So he never cracked the top 10 or the top five, at least, that I was going through. But Micker Adolfo is the first one that comes to mind. I know that yep. was a big time signing, tons of upside, just never clicked, uh, didn't work out. For him, I think um, Luis Alexander Basabe was the third player in the the Mancada and Kopech trade. 
Um, another guy who wasn't signed by the White Sox, but was a big time international guy, didn't click for him either. Um, I'm trying to think back at some of these other guys, but there, you're right. There has not been a lot of success aside from, I mean, Luis Robert was the big one, um, but in terms of players and signed by the White Sox that were international, there hasn't been a lot of success for a team that really values international signings and makes a lot of them. Um, there hasn't been a ton that have gone well. I, I'm trying to think of any of the other big time ones. Um, yeah, but Adolfo is the first one that comes to mind. I'm going to look and see if I can find any others. Um, but it's, it is interesting. What's your take on that? Because this, the Sox generally, I mean, Jose Abreu, that's, I guess that's one I should mention. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. He that, technically that's... wasn't a prospect. He wasn't a prospect because he immediately went to the majors, but that is, a, I mean, obviously a home run hit on that one. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, the fact that there hasn't been a lot of success in that department other than Robert? Well, again, there are, you know, there are a couple different ways to build a roster. There's the draft, there's international signings and trades um, are three of the ways. The draft up until Colson Montgomery um, hasn't really yielded very much, certainly compared to other teams. International signings, it doesn't sound like it's really yielded that much either. So I think oh, in a way... I'm, what am I, who am I kidding? Brian Ramos, too. That's the one I definitely should have mentioned. Oh, also. okay. Um, I know that's current, but Brian Ramos was an international signing, as was uh, as was Lenin Sosa as well. So, I mean, those are not not top five, right, in terms of those years, but more guys. But you're right. There hasn't been enough, as much success there as you would like to see looking back. What do you think relative to the draft? How would you describe the international signings? I'd say kind of on par, to be honest. I think I yeah. mean, drafts, like we've talked about today, like the drafts haven't been great. I think the last few years have looked a lot better so far. But generally speaking, the last decade of drafts and international signings um, have not been great. I think Gilbert Sanchez is another one that I just saw when I was scrolling through stuff. There, there's been some guys, but in terms of guys that have really clicked, Robert's really the only one, aside from Abreu, who was already a professional when he signed. Um, and then, you know, hopefully Brian Ramos, Jose Rodriguez, a lot of these other current guys are going to change that trend because um, there is some some upside there for sure. But it hasn't been all that successful. Um, our last year, 2023, talked about, let's let's the draft class uh, i know most people know this and then we'll we we've talked a lot about the draft class but tell us some of the first right. picks or yeah. first picks and then jacob gonzalez grant taylor seth keener and the other one of note calvin harris um yeah yeah and George you know Cal, um, is a, was a high drafted ball cow was the seventh rounder but signed to the second highest or third right. highest and the signing bonus of all the picks so um, another guy worth note and it's this is way too early to judge this class but generally speaking look has looked is an exciting class to follow for sure yeah, and um, it, much like the 2022 class, a lot of a lot of depth in this class. And if you look at the 22 and the 23 draft classes, God, was that make up what two thirds of the top 30 list? Yeah, almost. Yeah, you're not yeah. wrong. And then 2023, the top prospect list: Colson Montgomery, first round pick; Noah Schultz, first round pick; Edgar Caro, uh, trade another guy that was trade last year, the Giolito deal. That, uh, that, like we've said, we've acquired the, the, the talent acquisition via trade has been clear. It's just about the development from there and how that goes. Um, Jacob Gonzalez, first round pick. Jake Eater was another trade acquisition. Nick Nastrini, another trade acquisition. And then Brian Ramos um, was, you know, an, an international signing. So right now, looking at the system, a lot of players coming from a lot of places. And that's what's exciting about where we're at with this farm system. And that was really the culmination of, of this episode, in my opinion, Jeff, was that you can see right now the system is deeper and it's coming from all different places. There's players drafted that are moving up the ranks and impressing. There's acquisitions via trades that are going to be pieces for the future. There's international signings. Brian Ramos is the, is the top one. Jose Rodriguez, who are, who are legit pieces moving forward. There's a lot of players that have come from different places right now in the system. And that wasn't the case in a lot of these past years. All right. Um, and if you're going to assign grades, I would say uh, in terms of drafting the last two years, you have to give the White Sox an A. I mean, just because of the potential of these guys. Uh, international signings, maybe a B. They've done really well there. Trades, I would give them an A. So it's interesting. Going back to 2012, it was pretty mediocre for many years on all three fronts. But you're right. In the last two, two to three years, everything has changed and they look good. Their international signings, their drafting, and their trades. I want to build off your grades. I would say for the last two years, I, I do like the draft. I wouldn't go A. I would go B, I think. Uh, maybe B plus even. I think there's some good things. I didn't love a few of the draft picks. I think they could have gone a different direction with a few of the draft picks this past year. Uh, but I would give it like a B plus on drafting the past few years. I would say trades is an A. I think that's, I mean, that's a really good regard. 
international uh, beyond Ramos, I don't think there's anybody super of note. But then again, Mongolin um, and Ryan Burroughs, Ryan Burroughs, who's another guy who are two recent right. guys that are both really exciting. So probably a B there too for me. What about in the last, we'll wrap on this, um, in the last decade, now that we did this whole episode, we broke down all the draft classes, all the lists, over the last decade in total culmination, where would you go grades-wise in terms of draft picks, international signings, and trades? All right. So um, that's actually pretty easy. If you're going to give them an A for the last, if I'm going to give them an A for the last two years, I'm probably going to give them like a D minus for the previous year. So it comes out to somewhere around a C plus B minus for drafting international. I would say the same thing. You know, it's all C minus D plus trades. Um, I would actually give them a B B plus on the trades. They've got a, a history of really strong trades. Yeah. I, I'm similar to you. I think um, draft picks, Yes, I do like the last two years right now, and it's it's encouraging now, but it's you can't put that much stock into that yet because we haven't seen them reach the major leagues. So when all things considered, I'd go like C minus for drafting probably. I think when we look at – I don't think I realized until today when we really did this and dove into it and talked about it how poor some of those drafts have been. I mean there's been draft classes that have truly amounted to nothing, uh, unfortunately. Um, international signings. I do give credit for for both the Robert and I, I think Abreu is worth mentioning, even though he wasn't a prospect, just because international signings are such a gamble. And those are two, you know, superstars. Abreu was an MVP with the White Sox. Robert is as talented as it gets. Um, and then, so I'd go, I think I'd go B minus overall for international signings. Um, and then in terms of trades, yeah, not all of them have worked, but a lot of them have been good trades. And a good, in terms of value, they have done a good job getting value out of their players. So I think I'd go B plus and maybe even an A minus for trades. I think the trade yeah. acquisitions have been good overall. So looking back at this, um, it's it's cool to see. And I hope everybody enjoyed listening to this because it was I, I enjoyed going through all this and just seeing where the organization's at. And I think both of us agree that that right now, the organization is in a better place in terms of talent acquisition and development than it has been for the last decade. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, one final note, you know, we were looking at these other organizations. I think if you look at all those other organizations, they built their team. I mean, the Dodgers, for all the international, all the uh, free agent signings, they've got a core of players that they drafted. The Braves have a core of players that they drafted, plus, you know, Albies and Acuna, two phenomenal international guys. So you, you add those with like um, – Austin Riley and Michael Harris, you know, these other teams have done it. They've done it through uh, the draft, through international signings and through uh, yeah. trades. hundred percent. It's, it's yeah. important. You have to do it. And that's, it can be done. Era. The key to the next era of White Sox baseball is going to be how they develop the system. And we've talked about this time and time again, this year is a growth year, but the farm system and the signings and the trades are going to determine if this next era of White Sox baseball is a successful one. Uh, that's all we've got today. We talked a lot. This was a wonderful episode. Um, next week, again, tons of spring training content coming. Make sure to follow me at Elijah EV8, and you can follow Jeff at Triple A Jeff on Twitter. Uh, we are very excited for everything we've got coming up. We're going to talk spring training next week. We're hoping to have a few guests on um, in March before the season kicks off. Um, and that's all for the Future Sox Roundup. Thanks, Jeff. That was a lot of fun today, Elijah. Have a great trip to Arizona. Can't wait to start seeing some of your tweets and then talk to you next week. Very excited, too. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Yeah.